right, well, we're uh, rock'em, sock'em robots again today, so uh, if you have your Bible, you can go to James chapter 4. We're only going to do a couple of verses from James, and then uh, we'll, uh, uh, what's wrong with James? Who said that? James is fine, if, yeah, Chish, push, yeah, okay, James is just wonderful, just a straightforward sort of a guy, you know, um, calls it like it is, so um, anyways, we're going to be in verse 11 and 12, so I had planned on finishing the whole chapter, but never, never got there, so We'll see if it was indigestion or inspiration, right? Um, so uh, the previous verse, uh, James is writing, and he's talking about humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And uh, uh, that is God will bring you into a place of significance, purpose, uh, everything that we each have a desire for uh, is to make a difference in life, whatever that would be. Um, you know, for some, you know, it may look like ambition or whatever, but, uh, you know, there are drives that God has given to us, and many of those drives are godly drives, you know, that God has uh, placed in the human heart. Um, and, uh, but in order for God to do such things, I have to walk in humility for him to come by and begin to bless what I do. And humility be, can be as simple, and, and, and I, I just put this to you succinctly, it can be as simple as you asking. It can be that simple. Where you come and, uh, how many of you ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? Yeah, there was a big deal about the prayer of Jabez about 20 some odd years ago. Somebody wrote a book about it, you know, became the, the permanent fixture of the church for a year or so, the prayer of Jabez. Well, there's nothing wrong with the prayer of Jabez as you would have it. Jabez asked for God to bless him and expand the borders of his, uh, um, his life. And there was nothing wrong with that. And guess what? Uh, they kind of got blown out of proportion. But at the same time, is it wrong for people to ask for such things? You know, we've been going through money and all that, you know, different stuff. And we'll get back into money, James will, a little bit later down the road. But is it? Is it wrong to ask God to bless you? Is it wrong to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, go before me and bless what I do this day? It's not. It's not. Especially if it's for the glory of God. But one of the things that the Lord wants us to know is that he loves us. He's developing a relationship with us. And sometimes, yeah, what... He may do when I'm a younger Christian. He won't do when I'm an older Christian because he's been growing me up. But at the same time, you have to start somewhere. And uh, as simple as asking can be, that's humility. That's literally coming to God and saying, Lord, I, I, I want your blessing. I need your blessing. You're God. I'm not. Would you bless me? And it's amazing what God will do when people begin to just take simple steps like that in their walk with the Lord. You know, we always think big theological things like, you know, I have to get all my theology down before I can ever ask God. No. Ask. Ask. You know, ask. And... Uh, 
you know, God does direct and God does uh, amazing things. And he's, it, it's possible for God to do amazing things with everybody in this room. It is. I mean, I, I am a measuring stick of, of incredible grace of God, if you would consider it. My background and the things that I have done since coming to the Lord, uh, they defy logic in many ways. You know, who would take a high school dropout in the 10th grade and make him a land surveyor? I mean, land surveying, dealing with numbers, lots of numbers, you know, mathematics. I didn't go back to school. I learned it on the job. In fact, I found that I had maybe supernatural or natural, supernatural not in me, but God's blessing on me, a natural aptitude for math. And I was a good surveyor in the sense of uh, what I did. And I was trained for it. I went through my school of hard knocks as everybody else has to do when you're learning something. But at the same time, I was very good. I ended up running a couple of businesses, managing a couple of businesses. Who would do that with a guy that has a ninth grade education? But those are things that God does when he begins to work in your life. I mean, and I, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm great. I serve a great God. And he's able to do things that are way beyond what my imagination is. And so for each one of us in the same way, if we'll humbly walk with the Lord, it is, there's no limit to what he can do in the sense of his accomplishments in our lives. You know, if we were to go around the room here and ask testimonies, many of us would be amazed at what some of the people in this room do for a living, you know? And uh, that's just our God. So anyways, uh, he talks about humbling yourself and then now he switches gears. Apparently he's got like eight gears. My daughter has a, a, a car that she, her brother sold her that has six gears. And we were driving out of California because I helped her pick it up. And I never got out of four speed in <laughs> the fourth gear <laughs> driving down the freeway and it's whining and whining and whining. I never got it up to fifth or sixth, you know, and it was like my daughter, I, you know, I'm sure she's just totally impressed. I don't want to drive that car anymore because I can never get it up to, you know. Well, James has got eight speeds, so he's switching gears and puts in the clutch, and he's, yeah, I don't know if he's upshifting or downshifting, but... Whatever the case, it's, uh, he is just straightforward uh, dealing with sin in the church. So verse 11, verse 12, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Um, so he is just straightforward. Um, uh, I'm going to just go to the end of, of, of these two verses for me. I've been in ministry for a long time. I was at two churches before I came here. I was under two senior pastors and also other assistant pastors and other ministry leaders. And one church was 100 people, uh, roughly family church, a lot of kids. The other one was an up and growing, uh, I wouldn't call it a yuppie church, it had a lot of kids, but uh, 
It was uh, definitely a different style Calvary Chapel than the original one that I was in. And, uh, and they were growing. I mean, when I first got there, Karen and I, I think it was about 450 people. When we left, they were well over 1,200 people, and that was just a couple of years later. So it was a growing church, a powerful church. And, uh, but having been in the ministry and been around the ministry and been around church people, if you would have it, there is a thing that travels in churches called a critical spirit it's called a critical spirit it's where the underlings are taking what to task their other underlings and then the leadership of that church and they gossip behind the scenes always taking shots at the leadership well I wouldn't have done it that way well okay whatever but it, I've, I've been around it a long time. Unfortunately, I've had to repent of certain times when I have joined into that party, uh, thinking that my knowledge made me superior to the person that I was serving underneath, and it didn't, because I, I somebody just said it this morning, if, if you haven't traveled in somebody else's shoes, how can you judge them? You can't. And I had never been a senior pastor, but boy, I had an opinion about people. And sometimes we do too. You got bosses, you got managers, you got, you know, people that are involved around you. I mean, heck, a guy on a Navy ship, nobody ever talked about anybody on a Navy ship, right? Uh, yeah, right. You didn't question the captain or the, you know, the executive officer, never. Yes, divisional officer or, you know, the chief. Yeah. And it's called a critical spirit because we think we know something and we don't know it. And we certainly don't know what God is doing. And we certainly don't know that our hearts are being tested by the very people that we're serving underneath. Because you see, the Lord is interested not in my per se, um, how would you say, my, my outward. He's interested in my heart, and he wants me to be loyal to him. And sometimes loyalty to him is under difficult people and difficult circumstances, which I chafe underneath. I chafe. And so in my chafing, I begin to chatter. And it comes from the very things that are written here. He says, don't speak evil. The word for evil would be slander. What does it mean when you slander somebody? You're undercutting them, right? Little groups in some private room speaking evil against a brother or a sister. None of us have ever been around any of that stuff. Driven away from church and then take a shot at the pastor or shot at the ministry or maybe do it for some length of time. The constant chattering that goes on. Hey, I'm flawed. I'm a real guy, and I'm flawed. I didn't call myself to this. I've been called by God to do this. Uh, hopefully, I'm not an arrogant man, but, you know, if you find fault with me, join the club, right? Uh, you know, I could run through lists of names of people that some of you would know, and you would go, wow, those are the, some of the greatest teachers on the radio, and they are. When they get out of the pulpit, guess what? They're just like the rest of us. They put on their pants one pant leg at a time. And then when you find out certain things that go on in their lives, you're really amazed. There was a, a man that a few of you might know. One, one person in particular would know. 
and then and uh, he was on the inside loop of Calvary Chapel um, because he was he was that just was where he was at. He was a humble servant. He wrote some really good books, and he was a funny guy. And happened to know him somewhat personally. And one time I was at a, a conference. And he was speaking, and he talked about some of the people that I emulated. And uh, one of the things that he said was, it was amazing how you could get all those egos into one room at one time. <laughs> I just, I didn't say a word, you know. It's, it's like, okay, you know, this is from the insider, and I got some of the same stuff from uh, my friend Warren Wiersbe. He used to go speak at conferences, and he, he would come back, and he would tell me stories about, he would not necessarily name names, but he would say, you know, when you go speak at a conference, he says, when you get back in that green room, he says, it's not warm and fuzzy and friendly. It's like all these egos are in there and everybody's eyeballing each other. You know, who's the better and who's going to have the best sermon and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my. But that's a reflection on the human heart. We're real. People are real. That's just the way that it is. Well, guess what? Nobody's ever slandered you, have they? Everybody's had that experience where somebody's come by or you've made a mistake and they blew it up completely out of proportion to the reality of what really happened. Happens all the time, but it's not supposed to be happening in the church. And so James takes it right to task. He says, don't slander one another and don't judge one another. The word for judge is to bring to trial. We do that because that's where slander comes from, is we're making a judgment against people where we don't even have all the facts. I will tell you, there's a lawyer in the room. We don't have all the facts, you know? And so it's, you know, God has all the facts. And a good thing about this at the end of this message is the fact that even though God knows all the facts about us. Does he love you? Does he love you? He absolutely loves you, and he knows all the facts about you, and he knew that when you came to him. Right? It's always amazing how God can... I see it as right and wrong, and, you know... And, by dealing sometimes with other believers and God doesn't quite view it exactly the way that I do he's not on my side <laughs> he's on both of our sides because he died for both of us for both of us and he knows all the extenuating circumstances and everything else way beyond what I know and so he doesn't pick that place of saying, oh, yeah, you're right, they're wrong, let's go get them. Right? Where would the church be if that was, was our God? Let's go get them. Then we'd be under the law, and we might as well just put a pile of, you know, stones at each door. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, we'll get a pile over here and a pile over here, and you can throw them this way, and you can throw them that way, and then you can all throw them at me, right? Let's just stone each other. And we can do that verbally, and we can do that, and by doing that, we tear down the church. We tear down the kingdom, and we give God a black eye. Not that, you know, you could really do that, but... We give the church a black eye in the face of what? The world. And it takes away from the unity of the church and the purpose of the church. Uh, Peter writes to us and says what? Love covers a multitude of sins. 
If you don't have love in your marriage, you're not going to survive. Because you won't cover the flaws. Because the truth of the matter is, after you get married, between one and three years, you find out, oops, he's not Prince Charming, and, you know, she's not Cinderella, right? And as time goes by, you start focusing on what? The positives, and do what? Cover the negatives. Cover the negatives. If you're going to survive. That's just the truth of the matter, you know? It'd be nice if it was Disneyland, or so we think. I don't think so today, but, <laughs> you know, maybe back in the 60s, um, before we knew everything, right? But, uh, you know, so it means to bring somebody to trial. We do this by making judgments against people and by speaking ill of people, slandering people, is we are setting ourselves up as judges, as though we are perfect and that we're above the law and we've never broken the law, when in fact and truth we don't even know. Right? What I am today may be revealed later down the road that I got some character flaws that I've been covering up or God just never has pointed out to me until today. You know? Oh boy. Then you got to deal with that stuff. Uh, Matthew 7 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged, or you could say condemn not, that you be not condemned. It's another translation. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Now he's using hyperbole. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Self-examination is first and foremost. If I'm going to help somebody else deal with the sin in their lives, and Jesus using a comparison to the sin that I see in somebody else compared to the reality of sin in my own life, my own struggles, my own flaws. And he's using hyperbole for a reason because, you know, I mean, this first thing that you're taught if you're going to be a biblical counselor is this is where you got to go. You got to, Lord, I, I'm flawed myself, so how am I going to help somebody else to remove that speck? That speck. Does anybody here, well, just turn to one another and, and, and stick your fingers in somebody's eyes. See how well they like that. Nobody, you're not touching my eye. You're not getting at my eyeball. You know, natural reaction is I'm going to what? Close down and react and, you know, depending on whatever your intent is, might be more than you wanted as a reaction. But our eyes are very sensitive, are they not? And so he's actually saying, you're dealing with a sensitive issue as you come and you point out somebody else's sin. You know? You got to deal with it, what? Gently, right? Delicately, with grace and with mercy, right? So that you can remove that speck. Um, 
I wrote this down in the Amplified, uh, to judge is to criticize and condemn others unfairly with an attitude of self-righteous superiority as though assuming the office of judge. So that you will be judged unfairly or just as hypocritically judges uh, others when you are sinful. Um, and so he, uh, the, the interpretation is, guess what? I, in this attitude, the initial attitude is what? Self-righteousness. And I can do that. There's some things that just uh, are become uh, part of us as we grow in the Lord. And one is I add knowledge to my head. I add Bible knowledge. Well, what does the Bible say that Bible knowledge does to us? Puffs us up. What does it say that love does? It edifies. It builds up. Right? It builds up. It's actually, you know, uh, an architectural term. It means to build a structure, which is what God is doing, is he's building what? A temple through his people. Right? A habitation for the spirit of God. That's what he's doing. And so, as I gain Bible knowledge, and I have had gained Bible knowledge, well, that gave me that critical spirit because I had knowledge but I didn't have true knowledge I had a knowledge of the Bible but I measured somebody against that when I didn't have all the facts and I really didn't know and I forgot about some of the most basic things about my own Christian walk and that is I'm under grace I'm under grace I'm not under law, and yet I want to impose that law on somebody else. Yeah, ooh, yeah. So you wonder why I encourage you to read the gospel according to grace? Because the, 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 the book of Romans is about the grace of God. Certainly the chapters 1 through 11 are about the incredible grace of God towards not only Jew and Gentile, but anybody that will come to Jesus Christ, which would include Jews and Gentiles, but the grace of God, just let, let's just take one verse out of that. Romans 8, 1, how many of you know it? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know that one? Let me ask you this. Do you know that one for somebody else? Do I apply that to somebody else or do I accept it for myself and what? For somebody else, I use a different standard. That standard is for every believer, is it not? It is. Thank God. What's condemnation? God isn't going to throw me away. Oh, he may spank me. He may discipline me, but he's never going to throw me away. I'm not under that condemnation. I have passed from judgment to life. And so as every believer, anybody that is trusted in Jesus Christ, Yes, we may struggle in our sin, and they may struggle in their sin, the people that are around you. But there's no condemnation. There's no place for me to come and, what, bring that condemnation upon them. Um, when he says that we become judges of the law, the law that he's speaking of, or the the Greek language, the, the understanding is the first five books of the law. Um, 
And it's not the whole Old Testament. It's the first five books, the Pentateuch, if you would call it. That's the Hebrew term for it. And obviously that includes the Ten Commandments plus the other 603. How many of you know them? You lawbreakers. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, thank God you're not under that law, huh? Right? How many ate bacon today, this week? You lawbreakers. According to the Jewish law, you weren't supposed to eat any bacon. What a bummer life would be without bacon, right? No, I mean, there are just so many different things. So can you have some mercy and compassion towards the Jews who had to live under these 613 laws? Obviously, that would be incorporated in the social structure of society and the same thing for us in the United States as we had the fear of God we grew up for generations with the word of God so sin was what left in the dark well now we are no longer living under that where the word of God has power in the United States and so sin is coming out very much in the open right so it ends up becoming a social thing. Anyway, that's off, the, off the, the, the issue. He says, to be a doer of the law. What does the law literally tell us to do? And I'm talking Old Testament. What is the, 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 does it say that we should get piles of stones and we should go and make sure that everybody that sins uh, you know, any of those condemnable sins that we raise a pile of stones around them and leave them as a memorial to the next generation not to do such things? And you know what? The world caught on to that. And they twisted it. I remember seeing a movie when I was in grammar school about where one person was chosen out of this... Uh, society to go be killed it was the beginning of it was in the 60s it was beginning of the the tear down of the united states and the tear down of god's word because it was a total misrepresentation of who god was and what he was doing rarely do you see in the bible any place where god did that in fact Anybody that came, they came, brought it to the Lord. In Moses' case or anybody else's case, they brought it to the Lord. And sometimes the Lord, who deserved to die in the Bible, according to the law? King David, you think? Murder? Adultery? Those were both, you know, according to God's word, capital punishment, sins. Nathan said, God's put away your sin, David. Put away your sin. Who has a right to put away sin? God. Right? So who has a right to condemn? Only God. It's his law. It's not my law. It's his law. He gave us the law, and he gave it to the Jews to govern their society, but at the same time, it's his law. He's the one who condemned, right? The woman caught in adultery. They brought her in, they threw her right in the, you know, in front of Jesus, thinking they could ensnare him. This woman was caught in adultery. What do you say that we should do? What does he do? He stoops down and he starts with that finger writing. We have no idea what he wrote. We don't. But from the oldest to the youngest, they left. Pretty soon there's nobody there to condemn her. And the woman looks up and he says, 
woman, where are your accusers? They're not here. She says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Right? So what was this finger used for? To write against those who were going to condemn her. Do you get that? The Ten Commandments, the first two tablets that God made, how did he make them? He cut them out of the rock. And then it says he wrote on them with his finger the Ten Commandments. Whose finger was writing in the temple? That same finger, folks. The same finger. Right? Same finger. So, Moses goes back up on the mountain second time. He has to cut his own tablets. God would use his finger to write again, but it doesn't tell us that in this second occasion, but he did. Um, and Moses, when he went up on the mountain, the Lord passed before him. Uh, he uh, And so he saw the, the glory of God pass by, but it also, to see the glory of God was also to see the character and the nature of God. What about Jesus? What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Did he not say that? So if you wonder what God the Father is like, is he different than Jesus? No. No. Not at all. But he was human. I was thinking this morning, I watched a, a video. Uh, it's a Revelation song, but it had to do with the life of Jesus. And I was watching it, and there was a portion about where the woman was there. And it struck me. that that woman looked into a man's face. A man's face. A human. Oh, he was God, but he was human. That's my Savior. He has a human heart. And he has a nature that I don't quite always understand. But he's more gracious than I can ever imagine. He's more loving than I could ever be. His mercy goes way beyond anything that I could ever possibly extend to somebody else. Well, Moses goes up on the mountain. It says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And this is Exodus 34, uh, verse 5, and down to verse 8. Um, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Proclamation. He hears, he sees. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. First two top on the list. He's merciful, he's gracious. He's long-suffering. The best way to know long-suffering is reverse it. He suffers long. He suffers long. How much do I suffer? How much do I, you know, extend myself out for somebody else? Abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, 
forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Forgiving. But then it goes on and says, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So, who's not guilty? <laughs> Moses gets it here. He gets it. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sins and take us as your inheritance. What is he asking for? Forgiveness. He realizes they're guilty, and he ought to wipe them all out. And he includes himself in that. Did God wipe him out? Did he wipe out the children of Israel? He did not. Moses' intercession was sufficient. Was sufficient. Right? So what's this about? We have a God that has, what, a merciful and a gracious and a long-suffering nature. And yet he also has a holy nature that demands justice. Justice. How do you reconcile the two? The man with the, in the temple precincts with the woman caught in adultery. He was going to die for that woman not too long down the road. Within a couple of miles of where the temple was, he was going to hang on a cross. He was going to make the payment so that she could be forgiven. Who's the one that condemned? Is God. He's the only one that has a right to get down. Right? We see plenty of pictures in the Bible where God did not condemn when it would appear that the law demanded condemnation. Well, if we want to just go to the law, then guess what? We all deserve condemnation. You know, in the law, law there was no sacrifice you could make for deliberate willful sin you know that of all those blood sacrifices there was not a single sacrifice that could cover for willful sin it's not in there why why did God not make a sin sacrifice for willful disobedience because there was no animal that could do it there was no animal that could do it required the death of a perfect human being required a higher sacrifice than the you know trespass offering or any of those other offerings so when David came to the Lord, David understood. When Nathan spoke to him, David understood. I am under condemnation. I deserve to die. And Nathan preempts that with saying, God has forgiven your sins. How can God do that? Because he's God. It's his love. Believe it or not, he was looking forward to David because Paul, the great theologian, writes to us from what? Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven. David wrote that. David wrote that, and Paul takes that and says justification. Justification by faith. 
By faith in what? Me? The law? No, by faith in Jesus Christ that he made the payment that over my life is Roman, it's 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But I must apprehend that by faith. I cannot sit back and just say, oh, okay, I'm not under condemnation because the Bible. No, I must come humbly and accept what Jesus Christ has done for me. It's a personal thing. It's an acknowledgement of my great need, and it's an acknowledgement of my need being met in Jesus Christ to the fullest, paid for in full, purchased out of the slave market. You're no longer what? In debt to God. Good news. All we got from, you know, not being slanders to good news. I thank God for the way he put all this together. So I don't know. You figure it out. But I'll accept the last portion of this very much. But let's not set ourselves up above God in the blood of his law tear one another down with this so wonderful tongue that we have with my Bible knowledge that may be superior to somebody else when I look at their lives and see some of the things that I see that I realize I got a log I'm looking at a speck God for the grace of God for the mercy for the forgiveness for the covering there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus if you're not at him yet then today today is the day to get in today is the day from where you're sitting you're convicted. Lord, I, I finally get it. I accept Jesus as my Savior, the Son of God who came to make the payment for me. I turn to you. I give you my life. I turn from my old. And I turn to the new in you. And if you're like most, you're like, I don't know how this is going to work. Good. You don't know how it, you don't need to know how it's going to work. You just need to know who's going to work. That's Jesus Christ. What was the example? The serpent on a pole. People got bit by a s poisonous snakes, let's call them that. They were dying. No, we're in trouble. People come to Moses. Moses, can you go and ask God to heal us and do something about this? Okay. I don't know if he was reluctant or not. So he comes and God says, hey, what I want you to do is make a bronze serpent. Brass serpent, bronze. Stick it on a pole. Raise it up in the middle of the congregation. And everybody who looks at that serpent will be healed. It doesn't tell us anything else. How many people got healed? How many didn't? We don't even hear about it until later when he says to Nicodemus, just as the serpent was raised up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be raised up. Bronze is the medal for judgment. I deserve judgment. Sin needs to be judged. 
Anything that hangs on a tree is cursed. Jesus hung on a tree to do what? To take the curse upon himself that I deserved, right? Probably on that pole of whatever sort, there was probably a crossbeam at the top where they would hang a banner. So what was it? Probably a cross. So how did looking at that all of a sudden take the poison out of their system? We don't know. God said, do it, and this will happen. Well, today, if you wonder how you're going to get saved, is there something to drink? Is there something to eat? You know, do you need to get baptized? Do you, uh, what do you do? Tattoo? You know? <laughs> No, you come and you accept by faith that Jesus Christ will heal your life and make you a new creation. And over your life will be written, there is therefore now no condemnation. You could put your name in there for you. But if you choose not to, then guess what? There is therefore condemnation put your name in there because you there's no other place to find salvation except in Jesus Christ receive him today thank you Lord for your word I ask and pray God that uh, anybody that doesn't know you whether they're watching or whether they'll listen to this later or whether they're sitting in this room today would be their day it would open their heart. As the song says, it would let the healer come in. It would open their heart to Jesus Christ, realizing how much love that you had for them, that you would make a payment, that you would die for them. Lord, bless us now as we close up with the last song. Jesus' name.